Hello Bloomington, I'm Ray Moynihan, I'm a journalist turned academic and I've been writing about the medicalization of female sexual difficulties for more than a decade. I couldn't get off the beach. I'd go to the beach, I'd stay there all day. I couldn't, I couldn't move, I couldn't do any housework, I couldn't do any gardening. Eventually I lost my job, I couldn't work. All my life people have called me lazy, but now we know I was sick. Research shows that 43% of women suffer from female sexual dysfunction. But does the condition actually exist? Investigative journalist and author of Sex Lies and Pharmaceuticals, Ray Moynihan, joins us to shed some light on the issue. Welcome, Ray. <laughs> These claims that 43% of women suffer from this condition are, are clearly absurd. Please thank our guest journalist right here. Thank you very much to Leonor for inviting me to uh, speak to you briefly today. Thank you to the organisers and thank you for listening. I'm only going to speak to you briefly and I'm going to address three uh, quick questions. The first one is, why was I interested in, in writing about this area at all? Well, at the time, back in 2002, I'd been writing a lot about the way the drug companies helped to create the need for their products. Um, that, that was a phrase that was told to me by a, a drug company public relations person. She said, we have to create the need for our products. And, and so this was a, a classic example of creating the need for new drugs by helping to essentially create or sponsor the creation of a whole new area, a whole new medical area, a whole new disease, a whole new dysfunction called female sexual dysfunction. And it was happening in real time uh, back then. It wasn't a historical case study. It was unraveling before our eyes. The second thing was that the, the claims being made were so outrageous, so absurd, so audacious. This idea that one in two women might have a dysfunction called FSD um, was, was something that was of great interest and something that I thought perhaps uh, a lot of people might be interested in too. And thirdly, this was a feminist issue. This was a, there was a feminist campaign being waged against corporate fueled medicalization. I'd grown up in a household where feminism was, was normal. And so this was another thing that attracted me to this story. Uh, so we, we published a piece in the BMJ at the beginning of 2003, got an intense, strong reaction all over the world. Instantly, one of the drug companies, Pfizer, uh, hired a, a PR company secretly to try and mount a global campaign to discredit this article in the BMJ. Uh, that backfired terribly and only served to make me much more interested in this story. Um, I didn't know at the time that I'd still be writing about this and talking about it 14 years later. So the second question is, what, what did I learn in this 14 years? What did I learn about these issues that I was writing about? Well, well, first of all, I learned that this story really was happening in real time. And the more you, the more you investigated it, the more interesting it became. I read so many, so much junk science published in junk journals. I met characters from all over the world. I, I self-funded a trip to Paris uh, to see up close the way a, a drug company funded uh, conference works. Um, and, and I learned increasing amounts. And I, I kept with this story for so long that I've actually gone grey in the process. But what I, what I learnt is that over this, the, the, the time, you start to see patterns emerging. And it's only when you stay, as a journalist, stay with the story for a while that you start to see those patterns emerge through history. And, and what, of course, we saw with female sexual dysfunction was as each new company came along with its potential cure, the way the, the dysfunction was framed kept changing. So when Viagra was a possibility for women, uh, it was a disorder of blood flow prim primarily. And then when testosterone came along, it was, a, it was a hormone deficiency that needed to be fixed with testosterone. And then, of course, belatedly, when the, this failed antidepressant came along, uh, it was a, a, a disorder of, of brain chemistry. 
Um, I've watched as the companies became more and more desperate. And of course, in 2014, uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen this obscene astroturfing uh, as the industry became more and more desperate, uh, more and more desperate to get uh, a drug approved after so many failures. Um, I learned so much about this, I decided I wanted to share what I'd learned, so I wrote a book called Sex, Lies and Pharmaceuticals in, and published in 2010 uh, in, in different countries. And I realised that I'd made a mistake initially. I, I described this as the freshest example of, a, of corporate sponsored creation of disease. In writing the book and, and, and following this story, I realised that companies weren't just sponsoring the science here. They were in some cases actively helping to construct the science. They were, they were involved in doing the surveys that purportedly showed how widespread it was. They were involved in, in, in creating the diagnostic tools to diagnose the dysfunctions that their drugs would treat. And of course they were involved in, in, in designing the education in inverted commas for doctors and other health professionals. And, and so that really was a, that, that really was a very important learning for me to see the way in which companies weren't just sponsoring, they were actively constructing. Uh, and of course this became for me a classic example of a much wider problem and that is the merging of, of marketing and medical science. So the third and final question is what do I think of the, the New View campaign uh, looking back over the last decade or so? Now, of course, first of all, I should say that the New View campaign has really helped inform a lot of the way in which I've reported. It's not the only source, but it's certainly a key source for the way that, uh, for, for what, I've, uh, what I've been reporting on and writing about. Um, let me make a few observations about this. I think the New View is a, is a great template for what should happen in, in terms of responding to other medicalisation campaigns because uh, the medicalization of female sexual difficulties is one example of a very common problem and I think the new view uh, and its response should be used as an example in other areas as well. Uh, it's, it's a small campaign, it's a small group but with a huge voice. Uh, the way in which it has explicitly uh, worked with media uh, again, I think is exemplary. Um, so this very small group has had a very loud voice globally. And also it's used its voice very strategically with decision makers. Every time there have been major decisions, particularly at the FDA, uh, but elsewhere as well, the new view uh, and, and all of the people involved have, have put together very coherent, rigorous, responses uh, that have helped inform the policy and regulatory processes. So that's very important. There's been a passion there. Uh, it's scholarly, but it's passionate, explicitly so. And I think that's an appropriate response to the, to the corporate fueled medicalization that it's critiquing. And perhaps finally, the use of humor has been incredibly powerful. Now, this is not just Leonor, although who can forget Leonor's classic um, lecture that she gave titled Not Tonight Dear, The Dog Ate My Testosterone Patch. Um, but, but the humour doesn't come just from Leonor. It comes from, it's been I think a basic tenet of this campaign and it is incredibly powerful and very persuasive as a technique. But of course this is not just about getting laughs, it's about that, that hope that one has every time one opens one's mouth or writes that there is someone out there, uh, someone somewhere in that audience who is going to be inspired by this critique and, and who is going to use that to inform their future work. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you today.